welcome back to Best of the Day from the 2013 meeting of the American Society of Hematology. This morning, we're sitting down with Dr. Jorge Cortez from MD Anderson and talking about chronic myeloid leukemia. We've covered a lot of updates of, of uh, trials that have been carried out over recent years, and now we're going to talk about some of the newer trials and newer agents. So Jorge, thanks again for being with us. Thank you. So let's talk about the laser trial, and I believe you presented yeah. uh, this data. This, this is a trial of looking at patients with what was initially described as a suboptimal mm -hmm. response by ELN criteria, and I understand those criteria have actually changed a little bit. So a, a suboptimal response to nilotinib and then what to do with those patients. Increase the dose of, of um, on imatinib. In, increase the dose of imatinib or switch to a second generation agent. So tell us about the design of the trial and what the results have shown thus far. Yeah, precisely. This was a study and, and this was designed a, a few years ago. This, this is, uh, you know, after accruing all the patients on, and, and all of that, it's been going on for, for a few years. Um, so, but it was designed to address this group of patients that we, we called suboptimal response. So if I clearly identify the group that we call optimal responses, they're doing well. The ones who have what we call failure, those patients, we've established that they need to switch to a second generation TKI. And there was this middle category that was sort of like in between and, and, and Doing Europe, okay, but not great. Exactly. And the recommendation was you could watch them, you can change, you can increase the dose. So essentially, we didn't have an idea of what to do with them. So we said, well, um, what's the right intervention? Do you increase the dose of imatinib or do you switch them to nilotinib? So they were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to go to that. And they, the, the criteria could have been at three months, at six months, or at 12 months. The, the criteria that's established for each one, which essentially is more than 10% at three months, more than... Uh, one percent at uh, at uh, um, at, uh, at, at, at six months. Excuse me, more than no ser no any serogenic response at um, at three months. Uh, more than ten percent at six months, and more than one percent uh, or no complete serogenic response at twelve months. Right. Those were the criteria then, um, and the study has uh, almost hundred patients on each arm. And what we showed was the, the, the very first uh, uh, results that uh, come from this study. They, they just completed uh, one year of follow-up for the last patient on the study, so we were able to present that. And what it shows is that the primary endpoint was complete cell genetic response six months from the randomization. And the primary endpoint was not met uh, when you just look at the raw data. However, the study allowed for crossover. Uh, for patients who are not responding or who have lost their response, uh, etc. And when you adjust for the response, uh, for the crossover, and you consider anybody who crossed over as a non-responder, mm -hmm. um, then there is a significant difference. And that is because there were uh, many patients who crossed over from uh, imatinib to uh, nilotinib, mm -hmm. And uh, because they hadn't responded, and then when they re switched to nilotinib, then they achieved right. the, the response. So, so uh, they initially were moved from 400 to 600, didn't, did, respond. didn't respond as well, and then were switched to nilotinib. Exactly, mm -hmm. and then they responded. So we said, well, you know, that response happened with nilotinib, therefore they should be considered as a, as a non-responder to imatinib. So when you do that consideration, then there is a significant response. And the same thing happens, uh, better responses, molecular responses say, as well. So this is important because uh, it establishes that this group of patients does benefit from a change to nilotinib. Now, we don't call them suboptimal response anymore. This category has now moved into the failure category, but it is also important because it's, uh, it validates that that intervention that we've considered to a group that's more extreme into the failure um, for these patients who are, uh, you know, perhaps a little bit better than those other ones, but still we consider them failure, that that benefit is still there as it is for the patients with failure. So that's what we uh, think should be done for these patients. Very good. Well, we talked earlier about the STEM1 trial from mm -hmm. the French. Now they have another trial, STEM2. How does this differ from STEM1, and do they have any uh, significant follow-up on that trial as yet? Yeah, the STEAM2 uh, is uh, essentially a, a confirmatory trial uh, for the, for also done in, in France, 
where they've uh, looked now at uh, only patients that had been treated with imatinib frontline. The STEAM one, they took any patient who had been treated with imatinib, some after interferon, some frontline, and looked at treatment discontinuation. Here they wanted to, um, considering that you know, the, the patients that ever received interferon are now pretty, pretty much, much all, all right. uh, being switched, et cetera, uh, really, the important thing is that patients will start with the, with the TKI. Right. So they focus on, on imatinib, and they have uh, uh, recruited a number of patients. They had, I, I believe, 130-something patients. So it was a large study, uh, larger than STEAM-1 by now. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have uh, data on all of these patients because some are still too early. Uh, but essentially what they showed um, is very similar data to the STEAM-1. Um, essentially that the, the, the patients who failed who, to maintain the response um, have been um, usually losing the response within the first uh, th uh, six months. Very, they only had two patients that lost the response after six months, and that happened, uh, excuse me, four patients, two, at six, two exactly at six months and two like at nine months or something like that. Uh, the rate of uh, losing response is very similar to what they have on, on STEAM-1. So very, very consistent uh, data. Uh, and also that the patients who relapse, they respond again to imatinib. For the most part, most of them um, have responded. So um, essentially, this study just, just confirms the data. And that's, that's reassuring again. Um, and, uh, but as, as we discussed earlier, and as uh, uh, Francois Mahon emphasized in, during his presentation, uh, this is still something that has to be done in clinical trials. Yeah. Uh, importantly, for example, um, only patients that had a deep molecular response with five logarithm uh, sensitivity sustained for two years were eligible for this trial. Uh, so patients that have less of a response and has not been studied, and you would predict um, that the, the, the success rate would be much less. Well, I think it's interesting because as I recall from STEM1, the patients who had had interferon before going on imatinib seemed to be more likely to be in that 40% that, that were able to remain in, in CMR off of imatinib. But now this trial is just pure imatinib. So it's, it's re, reassuring um, that they're still seeing this same percent of people who remain in CMR of TKI. That is correct. Now, of course, one limitation of these studies, because it's a newer study, the follow-up is much shorter. I believe the median follow-up was 17 months or something like that. So there's many more patients that have to make it past those, those, that risky period. So we'll see. Uh, but it'll be an interesting observation if really interferon um, doesn't really need uh, or add, add much and we end up with similar results. Good. Well, let's talk about panatinib. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been involved with panatinib yeah. from pretty much the very beginning, from the phase one trials and the phase two PACE trial, and now you all have experience with, him, uh, with panatinib in, in frontline therapy. But there's been some trouble with panatinib lately, and uh, um, I have gotten the idea that this may be more dose-related uh, than anything else as far as the cardiovascular problems, but tell us about what's going on with panatinib. Yeah, um, the, there was a, an update at, at Panatini, the, the, the main trial, the PACE trial uh, here at the meeting. And, um, you know, first talking about the efficacy, uh, it does show that the drug works very well. You know, these, these studies, as you recall, had patients that um, over 95% of them had received at least two prior TKIs. About 60% had received prior, uh, three prior TKIs or more. Uh, about 25% of the patients had a mutation, the T315i. So a very difficult patient population. And uh, yet, in the cohort of patients in chronic phase, um, the, 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 the results uh, reported here showed 60% of major cytogenic response, which is, very which is a very nice yeah. rate. And most of these are complete cytogenic response. There was even a 38% rate of major molecular responses. So, so very, very effective drug. The issue was the safety. Um, and the safety, we knew about the pancreatic events, um, and that has, has happened, but it, it appears to be manageable mostly an early mm -hmm. phenomenon and, and uh, uh, grade three in probably about 10 to 15% of patients. Uh, but again, more manageable, transient, 
response to those. What's, what's been new, uh, both in the presentation and in the last few months that's, uh, that's uh, triggered some, some changes, um, is that there has been an increase in the cumulative rate of uh, arteri arterial thrombotic cardiovascular events. They were there. It was, there was actually a black box warning when the drug was approved because of these events. But the rate of these events that um, was about 8 to 10 percent last year has gone up to 17 to 20 percent um, yeah, this right, year. So with one more year of follow-up, there seems to be that the rate continues to increase constantly. Um, and that was what caused the concern um, why even the drug was at least temporarily suspended for marketing. Uh, it is available. Patients who are in, uh, in clinical trials can continue receiving it. Patients who need it can get a compassionate IND, but it is not just available for regular prescription at the moment. Um, and the key issue is because it is a, a, an effective drug, what can we do to, to try to get it back in on a, on, on a way that we can prescribe it for patients who need don't, it. Don't want it to become another uh, gemtuzumab ozacomycin. Exactly. And so, as you mentioned, one of the, one of the things that was uh, included in the presentation is, you know, what are the risk factors to see if we can change some of that. And definitely uh, having um, history of ischemic uh, events in the past and having risk factors, 90% of the patients who had these events had risk factors for that. So definitely paying attention to these risk factors. And the other one that you mentioned is dose. The dose intensity that the patient was having at the time this event occurred correlated with the, with the uh, occurrence. So one of the things that we are thinking that could be very, very important is that perhaps 45 milligrams a day uh, may not be uh, the adequate dose, that uh, perhaps 30 milligrams, which from the pharmacokinetic point of view, it reaches the plasma levels that we know from the laboratory are adequate to uh, even prevent the emergence of resistant clones. So, so perhaps 30 milligrams is a more appropriate dose. Uh, and for now, for example, every patient who has been on ponatinib, uh, we, we've instructed them to lower the dose to right. 30 or even 15 milligrams a day. Um, so I think we're gonna need to work on, on these issues about the dose, uh, perhaps preventive uh, measures such as giving them aspirin, um, statins, uh, you know, things like that. Controlling better the blood pressure because that's something that happened very frequently during the study and, and perhaps it wasn't as well managed as it should have been. Um, so all of these things are going to have to be addressed so that we can hopefully use the drug because right. we, it's a very effective drug uh, and just make it safe. Is Ariad planning to do a, a phase two trial at 30 milligrams versus 15 milligrams or something like this to see if they can establish um, efficacy and, and greater safety at lower doses? The, uh, the, the final decision of what exactly, you know, what studies are gonna be done and the design hasn't been done, but there's, they're being very aggressively looking at, at, at what can be done to minimize the risk and, and, and to, to improve the safety of the patient. So there's definitely gonna be uh, a lot of action, a lot of, stu of studies, a lot of of, uh, of, uh, of uh, things coming uh, from Ariad and, and, uh, and, and they're also supporting some of investigator-initiated studies to try to address these issues. Um, so, you know, recognizing the, the safety, right. but also recognizing the, the need that patients have yeah. and, the, and, the, and the, the efficacy of the drug. Very good. Jorge, thank you so much. I'm sorry we've kept you here so long, but there was just an awful lot to talk about. Uh, from this year's ASH meeting, so we really appreciate your spending the time with us. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. Very Thank good, you. and thanks to all of you for watching this segment of Best of the Day from the 55th Annual Meeting of the American Society of Hematology. There is more to come uh, this morning on myeloma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, so be sure to check back with us. Thanks again. Thanks.